Thank you for joining us in the Heart, Vascular and Thoracic Institute of Cleveland Clinic, where today we would like to speak with you about cardiac sarcoidosis. I'm here with members of our team, and together we would like to provide a multidisciplinary approach to cardiac sarcoidosis. We are fortunate that we have all the resources available to us to do this. And for that reason, we see many patients from across the globe who have this somewhat rare but very interesting condition. I'm Christine Jealous. I'm a cardiologist from the imaging section. And I'd like to introduce my colleagues, Dr. Manny Ribeiro, director of the Sarcoidosis Center and a pulmonologist, and Dr. Ziad Taime, who's an expert in heart failure, who will be joining me in this discussion. <coughs> So guys, I think one of the things that I enjoy about cardiac sarcoidosis is that we don't completely understand it. Um, Manny, some insights about the etiology of cardiac sarcoidosis and, and how we approach working these patients up, because I think it's something that we're fortunate to see quite a bit of, but in the, the general population, it's still a relatively rare condition, particularly yeah. pertaining to the heart. No, absolutely, Chris. I think, uh, so this is definitely something that we, we still don't know, right? What is the etiology of, uh, of sarcoidosis, what causes it? But there's a huge debate in the literature, many great researchers looking for specific antigens. I think um, even though we have different hypotheses, uh, the one that is the most accepted nowadays is that it is uh, a reaction from our immune system to something that we get exposed in the environment. I think this uh, environmental uh, uh, theory is very well accepted. And of course, it's not just the environment, but there's uh, definitely some genetic predisposition as well. There's some studies showing that this interaction between the environment and specific genes or HLA molecules, they lead to sarcoidosis in, in some patients and to different manifestations, right? There are different interactions that will lead to different uh, manifestations. As far as of specific etiologies, again, we, we still don't know exactly what, what causes it, but there's some good research looking into infectious agents as potential causes like mycobacteria uh, um, as one potential cause, or cutibacterium acnes, the, the uh, old uh, propenibacterium acnes, they just changed the name just to make our lives a little harder. But, but that's a very common bacteria that is present in our skin and, and the Japanese, they do a lot of research uh, looking into that as maybe being the cause of sarcoidosis. Um, some metals have been implicated, uh, working in molding environments. So all of those things are things that specific researchers uh, 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 you know, uh, identify as potential causes. But, but the right thing to say nowadays is, is that I think we still don't know what the cause is definitely something from the environment. See, Ed, when you see patients come into your clinic, what are the red flags that you're looking out for to suspect that someone may have cardiac sarcoidosis? Because I think in the past, there have been cases that haven't necessarily been detected until they've gone for transplantation or had an ALVAD implanted and on the explanted heart um, or the, the tissue that's um, analyzed, they have been found to have sarcoid. So what are some red flags that we can advise people of upfront? So we start going through these diagnostic algorithms earlier, hopefully therefore being able to initiate treatment more promptly. Yeah, absolutely. We typically see two scenarios, two major scenarios for these patients. Scenario number one, somebody coming with a heart disease that just did not does not make sense. There is something that is not right. It doesn't fit under the criteria of coronary artery disease, does not fit the criteria under, um, under um, um, you know, vital inflammation. There is something that does not really make sense. And in those cases, it's always nice to think about sarcoidosis. For example, ventricular tachycardia of unclear etiology in a young person, I would think cardiac sarcoidosis. Heart block in somebody who's 40 years old, I would think about cardiac sarcoidosis. And oftentimes it turns to be, to be the case. The other scenario is when somebody coming with a heart disease, but they have a history of pulmonary sarcoidosis or sarcoidosis of the skin or the joints or the liver in the past and they are now coming with a heart disease. Oftentimes, we found that they have a reactivation of the sarcoidosis this time in their hearts. So, so at the end of the day, we should have a low index of suspicion for, for considering that uh, as the etiology. I think one of the reasons that I'm interested in sarcoidosis is that we don't understand it. 
um, because I, it's always, uh, you know, it, nice to be involved at the forefront of research and an area that is still yet to be defined. I think we can see from our current diagnostic criteria um, that there are some discrepancies there. And so there's definitely room for us to become more aligned in how we can diagnose sarcoidosis. Correct. Manny, do you mind commenting on some of those criteria, how yeah. they've evolved and how we use them in a practical sense? Absolutely. So, so Chris, we've been doing this multidisciplinary uh, care for a few years, right? And, and uh, uh, we, our group, the uh, pulmonary group and the cardiology group, a few years ago decided that the first thing that we needed to do to take better care of our patients was to start a registry of patients with cardiac sarcoidosis. So we did that. Uh, we have this registry ongoing. We, 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 uh, um, we all participate on that. And the first uh, question that we try to answer was what is the best way to make the diagnosis in those patients? Uh, and nowadays there are three uh, uh, most uh, you know, widely accepted criteria to make the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis, three independent societies, uh, two here from the US. Uh, one is the Heart Rhythm Society, the other one is, it's actually a, a, a world uh, uh, institution, it's the WASOG, a World Association for Sarcoidosis and Other Grey Aromatous Disorder. But those are the two criteria that we use most of the time here in the US. And then we have the Japanese uh, Ministry of Health criteria that was recently updated. But three main criteria that we can use. And then what we decided to do as a group in that registry was Let's just apply those criteria to our patients, the patients that we think have cardiac sarcoidosis and see how they, they fit. And the two main conclusions from, those, from that uh, study was number one, about 40% of the time, patients that we think have cardiac sarcoidosis don't fit into any of those published uh, accepted criteria. But we still see those patients, we still need to take care of those patients, so, so that was one finding of that study. The other important finding is in the other group of patients where we could apply those criteria, there was some discrepancies uh, between the, uh, the WASOG and the HRS as co uh, compared to the Japanese criteria. So even you know the, the known criteria wouldn't always agree uh, when we apply to our patients. I think the most important message uh, from that paper is this multidisciplinary discussion is very important because we will not be able to make an accurate diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis in every patient just you know by using the, uh, those criteria so a multidisciplinary discussion is extremely important and then the last thing i'll say is nowadays there's a uh, a lot of uh, debate and talks about isolated cardiac sarcoidosis when cardiac sarcoidosis is only in the heart and the, the japanese folks just published the first criteria specifically for isolated cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, we are just now applying that criteria to our registry to see how things will uh, uh, perform there. But again, I think the message is the same, especially in those isolated cardiac sarcoidosis cases, this multidisciplinary discussion is extremely important and, uh, and uh, that's how we, we like to practice here. Absolutely, and I think in that scenario where we're relying primarily on imaging, um, sometimes we don't necessarily have tissue diagnosis for those patients where we suspect yep. they have isolated cardiac disease. And I'll have Zia comment on the yield of endomyocardial biopsy. But as an imager, we're often putting together the echo findings, the MRI findings, and then the PET results to within a certain degree of certainty, come up with a hypothesis that this is cardiac sarcoidosis. And so I think what we're learning as we do that, that there are specific patterns, there are patterns in where the enhancement is, where the inflammation is, that makes us more certain that this is sarcoidosis. Um, but there are also patients where um, you go back into their history a little bit more and you find out that perhaps they've got a family history of sudden cardiac death or something else that makes you think that there, there may be well another etiology underlying this. And we have to be very careful that we don't misdiagnose these people. Um, so I think genetics counseling, it, it, we are increasingly doing um, on patients, particularly those who are young, who are being diagnosed as isolated cardiac sarcoidosis based on uh, non-tissue findings. Um, so yeah, do you mind commenting on that? Uh, because I think that is something that increasingly we are wanting to make sure is included within the, the armament of what we do. Absolutely. 
Now, it's very important to, to acknowledge that the clinical history of that particular case need to match with the imaging, like alluded to, cardiac MRI, cardiac PET, and echoes, and it really should match with tissue diagnosis, should match with genetic testing, and it should match with response to treatment. If there are any misalignment in, in any of those, then we have to re-engage with our colleagues and ask ourselves this question, is it truly cardiac sarcoidosis? Now, once the clinical history matches the actual imaging, and it's very important not to just depend on one particular aspect of that, and we have to build the entire story, then where the tissue diagnosis comes in. We typically like to find out if there are any tissue areas that we can sample that are easy to reach, such as a lymph node, mediastinal lymph nodes, and in certain cases, we have to go for a heart biopsy. And the myocardial biopsies from the right side that are random have a very low yield of less than 10% because of the patchy nature of the disease. But more sophisticated methods that we have been using, including voltage guidance, in other words, accessing the left ventricle in collaboration with our electrophysiologists and try to do mapping, see where there's abnormal voltage and fractionation signal, imposing that on the MRI findings and the PET findings, try to take samples from the areas that actually are diseased. And this has increased our yield from less than 10% with the random biopsy to more than 70% yield as published in, in the literature. So once we become you know, certain or with high probability uh, that the diagnosis is cardiac sarcoidosis, let's talk about treatment, because I think that is also something that varies depending on the center, the location, the geographical spread across the world. Um, and that is something that I think we really believe that, that these patients, once we make that diagnosis, should be treated. Unlike many, you may comment on pulmonary sarcoid, where we don't necessarily always step in and treat, mm -hmm. but because of the, the potential for arrhythmia and for subsequent development of fibrosis within the heart, we do tend to treat these patients where we are certain of that diagnosis. And then there is always a debate about well, what should we treat them with, what are the optimal doses yeah. and the duration of therapy, yeah. um, and how often should we be imaging these patients along that journey. So yeah. I've thrown a lot of points at you there, guys, but in the last few minutes, do you mind giving me your thoughts on those? Because I think we have really solidified the way that we do this based on our experience over the last few yeah. years, and I think that's a, a, something that's worth sharing. Yeah. No, a, a couple of important points there, Chris. Um, so whenever we make the decision to treat patients with cardiac sarcoidosis, which I completely agree, I think it's mo most of the patients that, that, that we have here, uh, the first line is still steroids. There is some uh, 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 discussion about um, uh, IV versus uh, versus oral or, or what is the optimal dose, but but I think it's, it's safe to say that first line should be steroids. Here in our center, uh, if the patient is not having like a severe presentation with a VT storm or a complete heart block, we usually start with oral prednisone, uh, a 30 milligrams daily, and I think this is a good starting dose for our patients with cardiac sarcoidosis. This is based on a retrospective study from Japan that showed that giving more than 30 milligrams was not associated with uh, improved outcomes. So we go based on that. But again, no, no randomized control trials yet you know, to guide us there. Uh, hopefully pretty soon uh, we'll start seeing some of those. But we, we use oral uh, steroids uh, uh, to begin with. If patients are presenting with a more severe uh, manifestation like a VT storm or complete heart block, then in the hospital we'll do a pulse dose of sarcomedrol, one gram per day for three days. Uh, but steroid is that first line. The second point is we here like to uh, start a steroid spearing agent like a methotrexate or liflunamide early on. Again, this is based on a retrospective data showing that if we do that from the beginning, we achieve better outcomes. But uh, 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 the Canadians are actually organizing now a multi-center trial comparing those strategies, steroids monotherapy versus the combined therapy. Hopefully pretty soon we'll have that, that, that result, but we hear like to combine uh, uh, those uh, uh, steroid sparing agents uh, early on. And um, the duration of treatment, so once we make that decision and, and we prescribe those medications to patients, 
we tell them that it's at least two years of therapy, especially when we have a very confident diagnosis. This is based on uh, at least one um, uh, Italian study that showed that if we stop immunosuppression before that in sarcoidosis, the rate of relapse is significant. And it's probably even uh, higher for cardiac sarcoidosis because that study from Italy took a look at patients with pulmonary disease. So because of that high rate of uh, relapse, we tell patients at least two years, but I gotta tell you that, you know, we share some of those patients more recently I've been treating patients for even longer. As long as they are not having side effects to the medications, they are doing well, three, four, five years. I think the longer we treat patients with cardiac sarcoidosis, the lower the chance of relapse. And I echo that. I mean, generally speaking, for inflammatory cardiomyopathies, the approach has been followed in the, in the medical community. It either step up or ramp up or step down. Step up meaning you start one immunosuppressant agent and you see the response three to six months, if there is no response, you add another agent. But unfortunately, we're losing time three to six months where we could have cooled down the inflammation, prevented scarring. Here at the clinic, we'd use a step-down approach, meaning that on the, for on the front end, we start dual agents to save time and be able to save that fibrosis at the back end uh, and prevent really the recurrence. And at the same time, like we discussed, some cases we have still a little bit of doubt is that cardiac sarcoidosis or not but we treat anyways based on the risk benefit ratio and we if we have a good response to the immunosuppression that does support that diagnosis but if we don't see any improvement then we have been actually weaning off the immunosuppression completely and assessing for progress after that Thanks guys for your insights. And at, at this stage, I'd also like to acknowledge the other members of our team who've been phenomenal. We work closely with the folks in nuclear cardiology and EP who are into, integral to our meetings. Um, and I hope that uh, you have all enjoyed some of the insights that we've learned working together as a multidisciplinary team over the last few years. And hopefully we can bring you some updates as we get more information from that registry over time. But thank you for joining us today.